Hi everyone, I'm David Tresivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a podcast where we talk about the systemic issues of the world and the ways that we can or can't fix them. Today we'll talk about the ocean. What is the ocean? How do we depend on it? What are some of the important changes occurring to our oceans and the consequences some of these changes are having and will have and what that might mean for us as human beings? So Daniel, exactly how big is the ocean? David, the ocean is so incomprehensibly big. I mean, in terms of surface area, right? The ocean is 71% of the Earth's surface and growing because of rising seas. That's true. That's a good point. But also in terms of depth, right? I mean, if you took Mount Everest and you put it in the deepest part of the ocean, you'd still have a mile between the summit and the surface of the ocean. And that's just one point, right? But I mean, overall, the average depth of the ocean is like five times as great as the average height of all land. So it's an, a massive place. I mean, there are storms that happen out in the open seas, and the waves they create are so powerful that the energy in these waves is equivalent to 10,000 nuclear bomb explosions. And that's just massive. It's hard to wrap your mind around how big the ocean is. Okay, so we get that. It's big. But I mean, is it empty too? The ocean is extremely diverse. Yes, there are empty parts. Which is something we'll get to in a little bit. There are areas that are less populated than others. There's the tropics. There's the Arctic. There's even, you know, volcanoes spewing molten lava on the ocean floor in different areas. One of the things that I found that's, that's really interesting about understanding just how dynamic and enormous the ocean is, is it's something we've talked about before. These, these currents that are happening underwater. Things like uh, the Gulf Stream, there's other ones all around the world, but, but as Americans, we're most familiar with that one. Um, and the scope of these are just mind-bogglingly huge. So, I mean, we all know the Amazon River. It's an enormous river, the largest river in the world. It pumps out just an enormous amount of water, but that's absolutely nothing compared to the flow of the, the Gulf Stream, one of these giant underwater rivers. I mean, it's moving 100 times as much water as all the other rivers on Earth combined. It flows 300 times faster than the Amazon. And all this is happening under the water where we can't see it, and it really drives the currents, it drives the oceans, and it drives our weather as a whole. Again, this is one of those scope things. It's, it's amazing how much is going on, how huge these numbers are, and how much of an effect it has on everything because of that. Yeah, those layers in the ocean are just so fascinating, and it's caused by so many different things. You have layers that are based on the amount of light that can penetrate the surface, so you have well-lit layers and you have dark areas. You also have different layers based on salinity, the fresh versus the salt water. The heat causes different layers, warmer at the top, colder at the bottom. And as you might expect, with all this diversity in terms of how the ocean is structured, you get a plethora of ecosystems and different species that coexist in different parts of the ocean. Yeah, as far as I understand it, some of the largest forests, which is something that we only think about on land, but really do exist underwater as well. So forests that are like kelp forest, seaweed forest. And these are huge, enormous, very important ecosystems that are just a little bit outside of our sight. Yeah, David, the kelp forest really blew my mind. I watched an episode of Blue Planet 2, and there's this one scene where they zoom in on waters in the north. It's very icy and cold water. And when you go down into the water in the winter, it looks like nothing's there. It's very dead, very cold. But then the sun comes out in the spring. There's starfish that start excreting spores, and species just come to life seemingly out of nowhere. Sea cucumbers come out of the rocks. They stretch out like 10 arms to collect the starfish spores, and then they feed their mouths one arm at a time in this kind of circular pattern. And all these plants come out, and these giant kelp forests grow. And you have this diversity of fish that begin to interact underneath a lush green canopy, and it truly looks like a forest underwater. Yeah, I've seen some of those episodes. Uh, everyone here, you should really check it out. Blue Planet 2. Um, some of the imagery is just absolutely amazing with, with this world that we never typically see or think about. But yeah, this diversity in the oceans, it's amazing. And there's a huge amount of life there. Depending on the statistics you're looking at, it's anywhere from 70 to 90% of all life on Earth is in these oceans. It's not on land. It's not in the rainforest. It's in these seas. And it's an incredibly important part of both our global ecosystem and our economy and our society at large. For a number of reasons. One, you know, from the economic aspect that these fish and these fisheries provide with us, but also, you know, very basic things like the oxygen we breathe. Most of that comes from the ocean. Yeah, we really depend on the ocean in so many ways. 
like you said, our economy, we get oxygen from the ocean, and it absorbs a lot of our greenhouse gas emission and helps curb the effects of global climate change. So that's one of the most important parts of the ocean for us that we just don't think about and that there isn't even a lot of, of studies done um, about. There's a lot of modeling that, that sort of took this stuff into account, but uh, it's turning out that it's our understanding of this is, is basic at best and we're still learning a lot even now. But the ocean is hugely important in this climate change question that's happening right now. Let's, let's take a second and, and understand just how much energy is coming down into the ocean every second. When the sun is out, in a place like the tropics where they're getting, you know, full direct sun, we have the equivalent heat energy being added to the ocean uh, on a worldwide scale of multiple Hiroshima bombs every second. Every single second, another Hiroshima atomic bomb is blowing up, and that's the energy we're adding into the ocean. And for a long time, we thought the ocean is so huge, so massive, so deep, that all this energy that's pumping in, like, yeah, we know it's adding up to it, but this is such a humongous energy sink that we're not going to have any measurable effect on it. We thought that's the case with our pollution. We thought that's the case with our plastics. And we thought that was largely the case with CO2 and climate change. So are you saying all this energy is coming directly from us or it's a combination of us and the sun? It's energy that would normally be added because of our CO2, because of these greenhouse gases that we've emitted, that catches the energy that comes from the sun that would normally just bounce back off and go into space and to radiate out into nothing, is now instead being caught by the ocean, absorbed by it, and acting as this sort of giant heat reservoir. And for a long time, it's been actually a really good thing. The ocean has been warming slowly, but it's kept this heat that would normally just be going into our atmosphere and preventing it from, from cooking us, for lack of a better term. I mean, if this heat that went into the ocean went instead straight into our atmosphere instead of the ocean, we'd be looking at not plus two degrees Celsius, not plus four degrees Celsius, the catastrophic worst case scenario from the IPCC, but a crazy, like apocalyptic, Everything is extinct, plus 30 degrees Celsius. I mean, this is mind-boggling to try and understand just how much energy the ocean has absorbed and prevented us from cooking. And the problem is, is that as we've been warming this up, the rate of warming is starting to slow. And we've realized that because of this, all of our calculations about how quickly we are warming from climate change are slightly off because the ocean has been absorbing more than we thought. And now as that reaches sort of a equilibrium and there's less mixing and stuff going on, which is something we'll talk about in a moment, the capacity of the ocean to heat is getting less. And that means more of this excess energy isn't going into the ocean, but it has to go somewhere. And that somewhere is our atmosphere. And that's part of the thing that this climate changes, it, it goes on, this warming, it's going to get faster, and it's going to get way more dramatic. So hold on, if I understand this correctly, because the ocean has been absorbing so much of our greenhouse gas emissions. Well, it, it, part of it is, is the actual direct absorption of CO2 and stuff. But also part of it is the energy um, reflected from these greenhouse gases. So it's both lessening how much CO2 we have in the atmosphere and then also catching some of the extra energy that's reflected from these greenhouse gases. And so if, it, if the ocean's ability to do that declines, then that means the gases that we are emitting will have a greater effect on our atmosphere directly. Right. That means we warm more quickly and we warm way more than we thought. Okay, so as the ocean is gradually warming, what is going on? How does that affect the ecosystems within the ocean? How does that affect the way the ocean operates? Well, with any system that's as complicated as the ocean, the answer is it's very, very complicated. But we can sort of break some stuff down and take a look at it. So we have to understand first, we can't think of the ocean as this monolithic giant thing. The ocean's complicated. It has lots of levels. Um, there's different regions of it. There's different oceans. Uh, cold parts react differently to warm parts. And as we go deeper into it, different layers react differently. So thinking of it as like a centralized single being doesn't work so well. We have to break it down into different sections and stuff. So most of this warming that's occurring is occurring on the top section of the ocean. And the heat capacity of those layers is, is really extraordinary. So like the first 10 feet of the ocean, just to put in perspective, like not very deep at all, this is very shallow ocean, has the capacity to hold as much energy as the entire atmosphere. Okay. We're talking enormous amounts of systems that can hold enormous amounts of energy, which is why we see those enormous ocean storms, those giant waves. And so normally the energy would just sit there, right? And it, in a perfect system, it would slowly sink its way down and then equally be mixed and whatever. But the ocean's complicated. There's layers, there's heat layers, there's salinity layers, uh, there's currents moving in and out of it. And so all these different layers seem to be mixed by these intercurrents. These are things like the Gulf Stream, the Kuroshio Current, 
these very important underwater rivers that act as giant conveyor belts, moving water from warm parts to cold parts, low oxygen to high oxygen, and, and different salinity levels, and just acting as giant churning engines that keep the water very mixed and prevent the ocean from becoming extremely stratified, uh, which has a number of problems, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But as this ocean warms, some of these currents are disrupted. We're seeing this uh, in, in a number of major important ocean currents. The Kuroshio Current, Gulf Stream, AMOC. These things that were normally global engines driving this mixing are suddenly starting to slow. And we think most of that is from, one, warming on the higher levels, and two, the melting of ice uh, and dropping these very cold, low salinity waters into the deep ocean, throwing off this natural conveyor belt. And that has a lot of profound effects. So I think the way the warming kind of stratifies the ocean like you're talking about, it affects the way the ocean holds oxygen, right? So that top layer, as it gets warmer, warmer water can't hold as much dissolved gas, so a lot of oxygen leaves. So like when you have a, a cold drink, it stays fizzy longer than a warm drink because cold liquids hold gas better than warm liquids. And so as we warm the ocean up, we start losing oxygen. That's interesting because warm water holds dissolved solids easier than colder water. But So I guess that's one effect going on. But then the other effect of this stratification is that part of this mixing process that you're talking about, because warmer water rises and separates from colder water, that top layer, which also gets the most oxygen because it's interacting with the air, would normally circulate that oxygen to lower levels just by natural mixing. But this stratification prevents that. So there's a, a big part of the ocean that's not getting as much oxygen as it normally would. Yeah, so this is one of these really unforeseen consequences, so, something that's invisible but has huge effects on the, the inhabitants of the ocean. Uh, we get these things in the mid-levels. They're called oxygen minimum zones. Um, there's also other ones called hypoxic zones where there's literally no oxygen, and, and things that happen to wander into these suffocate. It's weird to think about things uh, in the ocean as having like different pockets of oxygen levels, but it's really not so different when you think about it. As we climb mountains and we get higher, right, there's less oxygen available to us. Well, the same thing happens in the ocean. As you go deeper, there's less oxygen. Normally, that's okay because uh, fish live in these certain vertical regions where they, the oxygen levels and the pressure and the light are appropriate for them. But as these oxygen minimum zones merge and then expand, um, and they expand not just just like out horizontally, but also vertically. And it starts compressing the space that these these ocean inhabitants live in. You see it in some places, fish that would normally dive down, you know, 300 feet or, or even deeper, you know, 300 meters, um, suddenly aren't diving deep at all. They're living much closer to the surface because if they went any deeper, they literally suffocate to death because there's not enough oxygen in these areas. You're seeing dramatic changes in the way fish behave. And that has a big effects. As you compress the living area of these, these animals, they start living closer together. Predator lives next to prey. And it has profound effects on ecosystems and food chains. Yeah, these low oxygen areas, I think, have expanded by more than 1.7 million square miles in the past 50 years. So it is having a profound effect. And not just those species that are living at the top layer, like you said, that are getting compressed. But there are mid-layer fish, these fish that kind of live in these dark areas of the ocean, and they only come up at night to eat phytoplankton. But because their environment is getting a little bit more oxygen-starved, they have to come up more often for oxygen and are often exposed to the light where it's much easier for prey to take advantage of them. And some of these fish are the backbone of, of marine food chains. And as we see more species that are on the bottom of the food chain get devastated for various reasons. It will affect the ability for larger species to survive, which could have even bigger consequences for us. Right. And these areas are expanding dramatically and expanding quickly to the point that a lot of scientists uh, who weren't even aware this would be a problem just a decade or two ago are shocked to find these, the size of these fisheries shrinking and moving around and literally displacing fish into parts or into places that they would never have lived before. And we're seeing a dramatic worldwide decrease in the amount of oxygen that's in the ocean as a whole. And this has huge unforeseen consequences for the future. By 2100, we're supposed to see a 7% decrease in total oxygen levels. But remember, this isn't just across the board. Um, some areas will see 10, 20, 50% decreases in oxygen, which makes life uninhabitable. And so where we once had this enormous, huge rainforest of life, 
uh, where there's lots of animals and, and, and fish living everywhere, we're suddenly getting huge blue wet deserts where life literally can't survive because there's no oxygen for them to breathe. In addition, these shifts occur in microbial ecosystems as well. I think a lot of microorganisms that are moving and shifting to these low oxygen areas, these microorganisms that thrive on these types of areas produce nitrous oxide, right? Which is really bad for our atmosphere in terms of its effect on global warming. Yeah, and even worse, they're replacing these phytoplankton and other uh, small microorganisms that would be creating oxygen and making this problem worse. So it becomes this cascading failure, this feedback loop. Uh, which is the deadly word that we keep coming back to when we discuss any sorts of these climate change things to make the problem worse and to make things get worse faster than we expected. But that's not all. There are worse things going on in the ocean. So this, this is all related to the process of deoxygenation, right? Removing oxygen from the ocean. And that's like one of three major processes going on in the ocean right now, right? This triple threat. Of, of climate change, natural processes, yeah. And I guess one of the other processes that's really connected to this warming process is acidification of the ocean. Yeah, that's, that's the big one here. And the one that's maybe the, the most surprising for biologists and researchers. Carbon dioxide that goes into the ocean lowers the pH, overall pH level of the ocean by producing this carbonic acid, which has huge implications for our coral reefs, fish, phytoplanktons, etc. that we really rely on. Yeah, and I, I don't want to undersell just how much of a tragedy this is. The largest extinctions in all of the history of life on this planet have been because of ocean acidification. Um, some of the largest ones of these killed 95% of all life on Earth. And right now, as best as biologists and geologists can tell, the ocean is getting acidic faster than at any other point in the entire history of the planet. We might be on the cusp of one of the greatest ex extinctions ever. So we're creating the same conditions that led up to, I guess, one of the worst extinction periods on planet Earth. Is that what we're looking at then, is a mass extinction in marine biology? Yeah, a number of biologists, a number of scientists, even the UN, is concerned about this and are writing lots of reports on exactly this subject. It's not something that we're trying to oversell and make dramatic and stuff, but we really might be sitting here watching the start of one of the largest mass extinctions ever. Um, I, I really don't want to undersell this, um, and the literature that scientists are putting out also really discusses this as the beginning of a major mass extinction. So I'm really curious to know how exactly species dying off in the ocean might affect us on land, but, but maybe it would be good to have an understanding of what acidification is in the first place. We haven't really gone over exactly what that process is and how it's affecting life in the ocean. So, I mean, the process is very simple, and historically, it's never happened as quickly as it's happening right now. So part of the ability of animals to evolve around this uh, just isn't there because this change is happening uh, in, in too short of a time, but we'll get to that in a moment. So the basic component of what's happening is there are a number of sea creatures that have shells, right? So things that we find washed up on the beach, clams, crabs, whatever, but also lots of little microorganisms, things that we can't see or that are, are, are difficult to see without a microscope. And these microorganisms depend on these shells, um, and lots of them have early stage processes of their life where they have shells. So these shells are made out of calcium carbonate and other similar molecules. And as the ocean acidifies, these shells literally dissolve. Okay, This kills the animal. And a lot of these animals, especially these microorganisms, are the, the single like, base level of these food chains. And as you cut out the bottom of a food chain, everything that's above that dies. And if it's the bottom level of the food chain, then the whole food chain dies. And that's what we're looking at. Um, and we're seeing this most dramatically in the, the coral reefs right now. Yeah, so coral reefs are these incredibly important parts of the ocean, right? They're very diverse. They're very beautiful. The Great Barrier Reef off the northeastern coast of Australia is a huge tourist destination because it's so colorful. There's so many different species there. And so many of the fisheries that we have come to depend on for food are supported by these corals. And it covers less than 1% of the ocean floor. So it's amazing how important it is given its small size. And they're being threatened by this acidification. The acidification is eroding their shells, and a lot of reefs have disappeared. And the Great Barrier Reef itself is decaying and will probably disappear if we can't do something to stop the acidification going on. Yeah, last I looked in 2017, over 93% of that reef had been bleached uh, in large parts 
over 80% severely bleached, meaning to the point where that these coral may never recover, may die. And and we should note that acidification isn't just part of what's causing this coral bleaching. It's it's a twofold effect. So one, the acidification literally is dissolving the, the structure that holds these corals together. The sodium carbonate that holds these structures is dissolving in the water, which makes it difficult for the small animals that live on this that creates the colorful and coral and the algae and stuff to survive because there's nothing to grab onto. But the, the one-two punch of this is also the warming of the ocean. When we see these flashes of warmth, especially during El Nino years, um, those raise temperatures, and we're talking only a degree or two Celsius, wreck these coral reefs. Um, the algae that lives on these suddenly can't survive, and this symbiotic relationship that happens between the coral, algae, and, and all the creatures of the reef is wrecked, and this steady state disappears, and we see this bleaching effect. And so this is a really great example of how all these systems are interconnected and interact in ways that we don't initially consider. The ocean absorbs our carbon dioxide. That keeps us from warming too much. It's absorbed 30% of our carbon dioxide, saving us. But at the same time, it's causing this acidification problem. Um, the excess heat that's coming in anyways is increasing stratification in the ocean, which causes deoxygenation. The warming water itself is also contributing to damaging of the animals that live in the ocean, especially this, this coral bleaching and stuff. And so we see this effect of this causes this, but it also leads to that. And then this other thing over here ties into this and makes it worse. And some of these have profound effects and, and can really get out of control in ways that we, we haven't considered. And one of these really potentially deadly ways that these things are interacting is tied to the very oxygen that we breathe. So much of that comes from the ocean, and we're almost entirely dependent on these phytoplankton, on these algae that live in these waters. And we've come to depend on it, and life has come to depend on this. But recent research suggests that maybe we might not be able to depend on this going forward. This phytoplankton that you're referring to accounts for like 70% of all the oxygen in our atmosphere, right? I mean, these are the little microbes that live on the surface layer of the ocean that I guess we take for granted. But that's a huge amount of oxygen. Yeah, and it's not just oxygen, but these algal blooms also have important climate change fighting effects. So when they bloom... First, they pump all sorts of oxygen into the ocean, which helps with their deoxygenation problem. But they also, while they're blooming, they outgas dimethyl sulfide, which is a gas that goes up and, and causes clouds to form above the water, which uh, ha is important for our global weather patterns. Cools down the ocean, also reflects sunlight back into the atmosphere and, and out into space. So it has that, this anti-global warming effect. Um, and then beyond that, even dimethyl sulfide acts against greenhouse gases. So these algal blooms, which we mostly know as like something toxic that we, we can't swim in this lake or something because there's a toxic algal bloom, which is sort of an effect of, of some of these feedback loops, which we'll get to in a moment. But they're very important for the health of the ocean and our survival as a species and fighting climate change even. But that might not be something we can depend on. And one of the ways that we may not be able to depend on these phytoplankton is for their oxygen production. I mean, the study that you're talking about is a modeling paper, right? It tries to model what could happen to these plankton as their environment warms. And it suggests that at a certain warming temperature, the ability for these phytoplankton to produce oxygen breaks down and they can't do it anymore. And it even suggests that if these plankton can't produce oxygen, like we've come to depend on them, we could experience the same atmospheric condition that mountain climbers do at the summit of Mount Everest just at sea level on land. So we would not be able to survive anywhere on the earth unless we had these oxygen masks, right? And so that's a critical function that this phytoplankton serves us that we don't want to lose. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I do want to caution, this is a modeling paper. It's not a predictive study. Just saying, well, if these things worked out, this is what could happen. But the, the conditions to get to this point were very mild. I mean, it's, it's dramatic in the long term, six degrees Celsius warming of the waters. I mean, that's it. It's a huge jump in, in the overall average temperature of the ocean. But in small areas, that's totally possible. And that's something that we might see with how much energy is being pumped into the system with the lowered mixing that's happening as the stratification intensifies and concentrates that energy adding into the top levels of the ocean. We might start seeing this. And there's other loop feedback loops in here as well. So like things on land even are affecting stuff in the ocean. As we see more CO2 in the atmosphere, we're seeing uh, global greening, as they call it. There's a lot more plants growing. And this will be true up to a point, and then it actually will roll back some, which is in talk discussion for another time. But this global greening 
has meant that some areas that were initially desert or dirt are now covered in grass. And this grass prevents erosion. Um, and so all of a sudden, these like very important rich minerals and dirt that would be caught up by the wind and blown into the ocean hit the ocean and act as, as seeds for the, the nutrients that these algal blooms require in order to bloom suddenly aren't there. And so we're seeing less algal blooms in the ocean. That means less dimethyl sulfide. That means less clouds. And that means less oxygen in the ocean. Um, and climate change is that much worse because of it. It's lots of these unforeseen feedback loops where something small in one part ties into something else and causes a problem here, which reinforces the other problems. And that's really the main problem of modeling these complex systems and trying to estimate exactly how bad climate change is going to be. And every time we find one of these feedback loops and we realize it's not in our models, uh, we find that even our most dramatic models just aren't catastrophic enough. There are so many things in the ocean there are so many processes, so many ecosystems that are so vital to our way of life and to life in general. Seagrass, for instance, is one of these. It's not something we would normally think of, but it supports 50% of the world's fisheries, right? This food source that we depend on. And it's a huge sink for carbon. A patch of seagrass, I mean, it literally just looks like grass that you would see on your front lawn. So this is really incredible that a patch of seagrass can store 35 times as much CO2 as the same area of a tropical rainforest. That's just incredible. And these seagrasses are declining by 7% per year. So that's, that means in 10 years, half of all these grasses will be gone every 10 years. And we don't fully understand how all of these things are interconnected and what feedback loops are there. Wait, why are these grasses dying? Well, they're dying from a whole a number of reasons, from the usual stuff you would think of. And some of these feedback loops that we've been talking about are contributing to this decline, in addition to very direct actions that we are doing, like our runoff from our agricultural productions, our coastal developments, our land reclamation projects, oil extraction, and the sewage that we put into the ocean. All of these are combining to disrupt these feedback loops, these natural feedback loops, and directly causing the decline of some of these very important ecosystems that we rely on. And it really is incredible how some of these systems have balanced themselves. Like in the seagrass environments, you have sea turtles and they feed on the seagrass. And then sharks will come to prowl these waters to try to eat the sea turtles. And what's really interesting is that this is a good relationship because the shark causes the sea turtle to kind of move and change position as it tries to avoid being eaten. And in moving around, it prevents the sea turtle from overgrazing any particular patch of seagrass and preventing it from growing back. All these ecosystems are in a very steady, balanced state. And as soon as we start contributing any of this stuff, as soon as climate change starts pumping energy in, as soon as we acidify the ocean, as even more direct actions like our pollution, our plastics, which is a conversation for another time, starts disrupting these steady states, uh, then we have huge consequences declines in fish, declines in environments, declines in oxygen um, that we have to worry about. And that will have profound effects, not just on the oceans, but on us who are very dependent on the ocean. I mean, how dependent are we on the ocean exactly? It's actually really hard to find data on just how dependent we are, because I think it's something we take so for granted that there's very little research done on, on direct effects of it. But most of the numbers that you find are things that are economic in nature, like uh, X number of dollars extracted and fisheries, uh, 100 million tons of fish extracted, very like generic basic stuff. But I mean, one of the most direct basic dependencies that we have is, is as a source of food. Um, and statistics here vary wildly, but I mean, over half the world is 20% dependent on the ocean for their protein needs. And a smaller portion of the world, a, a billion, a little over a billion, are 80% plus dependent on the ocean as their source of protein. You wipe out these fisheries, you wipe out the ocean, and you have billions of people starving. And it's not just like an extinction level thing, but even small declines in the fishery stocks can mean increased prices, which can put these resources out of the hands of people who need it and can have profound impacts on our nutrition. And so over a billion people depend on fish in a very significant way for their food source. I'm assuming this is the developing world, right? These poor regions, Pacific Islands, Southeast Asia, these developing countries are the ones that are going to be most heavily affected by this. Yeah, exactly. Like everything climate change related, it impacts the poor the most. And you're talking about totally wiping not only the nutrition source for these people, but also the livelihood for a huge amount 
of these developing nations where they're wholly or at least mostly dependent on the ocean for their way of life uh, from everything from food to employment. Um, and even in, in developed nations like the United States, the people who are going to be impacted, these fishermen, are some of the, the most at risk. There, Lots of them are freelancers. The margin is already low. And as these fisheries decline because of both overfishing, because of pollution, and also these natural processes, which I say natural but are caused by man-made uh, global warming, they're going to be at risk as well. And, and this industry is going to slowly die and, and have huge effects both domestically and abroad. And so what do we need to do here? I mean, lower our carbon emissions, uh, switch to renewable energy. Surely if we reduce our carbon emissions, we're reducing the warming effect that will take place on the ocean to combat that warming, right? We'll be putting less carbon into the ocean, which is contributing to acidification. Yeah, I mean, sort of. So part of the problem is this scale of the ocean, this thing that we thought was so humongous that we could never possibly affect it. Turns out we were wrong. But at the same time, it makes it really difficult for us to do things to fix these problems because the scale necessary is just so massive uh, and so expensive that it might well be out of our reach. So some of this, too, is the climate change is, is locked in a little bit. There is lag in the ocean. This energy isn't going anywhere. And we can't exactly easily suck all this carbon out. Because first off, we don't have the technology for that. And secondly, there's nowhere to put it. So we are not going to change the state it's at, and it, this is going to continue for a few decades because there's lag built into the system. It's going to keep getting worse. But we can make things less worse in the future going forward by switching to renewables, by putting less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, um, and, and making sure that these problems on the road don't get even worse than they are now. But there's very little we can do to affect these things directly. With that said, though, there are some crazy plans. Crazy plans along the technological innovation that we might need to do? Well, it's, it's actually very technologically simple. It's just a matter of scale. So it takes something very simple and just expands it across millions of square miles of the ocean um, in order to make an effect on it. One of these very popular ideas is called iron fertilization, where we dump iron, iron sulfate, into these iron-poor sections of the ocean to act as that seed to cause these algal blooms. And if we do this and we're dumping tons and tons of this stuff into the ocean and we cause these huge algal blooms, then we can pump oxygen more into the ocean. You're going to start seeing a lot of these in the next few years, in the next few decades. They're usually very expensive. They're at enormous scales. And really, they have such crazy, profound side effects or unforeseen side effects. This is one of those potentially unforeseen consequences thing, where maybe we think we're doing something good, but because of the scale of this, we've actually messed things up even worse. Uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion and, and controversy over these going forward. But I imagine we'll eventually get to a point in maybe a decade or two where people just say, fuck it, we're in a bad enough situation, we need to do this anyway, uh, because otherwise we're going to die for sure. And so this iron fertilization is one of these processes, um, and the hope is that doing this at enough of a scale, you know, 20 million square miles is the number I see quoted, uh, that, that it will have a measurable effect on climate change and on the health of the ocean as a whole. But who knows what side effects that'll be. And they've actually, they've started running experiments on this. They've okayed it and, and they are dumping iron sulfate in some areas to study the small local effects. Um, but we found over and over in the ocean with such a dynamic, complicated system that small effects in localized areas don't necessarily play out on a global scale. You know, what's crazy to me is how so many of these climate related issues in our world are a result of a short sightedness, right? That Either we didn't want to see, we weren't incentivized to see, or because of the complexity involved, all these delays and all these feedback loops that take a long time to understand, because we have failed to understand these systems fully, the energy that we've just been pumping into the environment without restriction, causing all these problems, it would seem like the solution is to just slow down and say, hey, we don't understand the environment, we don't understand all these feedback loops. We need to stop putting so much energy into the system. We need to slow our economic growth a little bit. We need to slow our need to extract everything and to just wreak havoc on our environment. But it seems like this situation has got to a point where even if we were to stop all our economic activity right now, like you said, a lot of this is baked into the system. These delays are going to be resolved. And so we have been kind of forced into this corner where we have to try something drastic, e pump even more energy into the system in this kind of potentially overreaction. But we don't really have a choice, do we? Yeah. And I think that's the danger with these geoengineering projects. Um, they're going to be 
have such profound long-term effects, but there's not going to be the time or the political will to look into this and figure out just what those effects might be because the short-term need is going to be there. It's going to be, we need to fix this now so we don't die in 100 years, to we need to fix this now so we don't die at this moment. And when that happens, there's not going to be any time for long-term thinking and long-term consequences because we're going to be stuck in the moment. And so much of our system, like you said, is focused on short-term, short-term gains, short-term whatever. And there is no time to look into the future for these long-term consequences to see how we're affecting stuff because the system itself is dependent on infinite growth. Um, we have to keep growing. We have to keep producing um, or else it all falls apart. Even basic things of our social structure and our social safety nets are dependent on this growth. And when you stop that growth, even just limit it to the same level, not even increasing it, but say, OK, we've we've hit a baseline. We're going to stop here. We're going to suspend. Gr growth is going to be zero percent. The whole thing falls apart. And when that's the case, you know, there is no fix. There is no way to shift from short term to long term. And that's why we see so much to uh, hope centered on things like renewable energies so that we can keep growing and keep consuming more, but while, you know, emitting a little bit less CO2. And this is a good time to point out that, you know, these renewable energy sources aren't carbon neutral themselves. If they were directly replacing carbon producing stuff, then we'd be better off. But a lot of them are additional energy added onto the system and they require CO2 to make. They burn fuel to make. There's electricity burnt in order to create this stuff. And even these green energy systems added on are still CO2 producing, are still contributing to the problem, just less than they would be if it was a replacement. But because it's adding on, uh, or it's just contributing to the problem. So the ocean is a very complex system. And so is our, our social, economic, and political systems. Our solutions going forward are not so simple. And yeah, you know, I think it's easy to criticize the way our economic system has been going forward with this need for infinite growth. But like you said, 0% growth isn't really the solution either. And it's important to point out that not all growth is the same, right? It, it seems like our economy has focused mostly on this type of quantity and physical growth, right? Expanding of physical infrastructures, expanding of populations, expanding of wealth. And I think if we're really going to go forward with sustainable goals and try to solve these problems realistically, we need to think of growth less as a quantity that we need to just expand and we just need to multiply quantities of production and extraction and think more of qualitative growth. So how can we improve the welfare of society? How can we improve our processes so they're more efficient and more sustainable? And how can we share the benefits of all these systems with everybody and not just a select few? And so that's the type of growth we need to be looking forward to. And I think if we focus on that type of growth, this quality for our society, we will be incentivizing solutions for these problems that go beyond the mere short-term profit incentive. I think that's a great vision for the future, Daniel. If you want to learn more about the things we've discussed today or listen to old episodes and find additional information, visit our website at ashesashes.org or find us online on your favorite social media network at Ashes Ashes Cast. Once again, thanks for joining us. We've got a great show coming up next week that we're really excited about. And we can't wait to share it with you. Bye. Bye-bye.